Por Design Bienal, Alter Realidades, Desenhar o Presente. De 2 de junho a 25 de julho, em vários espaços do Porto e Matosinhos e também online. Exposições, conferências, workshops, conversas e instalações. Saiba mais em portdesignbienal.pt sextas-feiras de julho durante a Bienal de Design do Porto de 2021. Esta é uma rara oportunidade de, de levantar algumas vozes radicais uh, no design, muito necessárias no mundo binário e populista da política contemporânea. And now in English. I'm Alistair Fouad Luke, uh, curator of the Bienal. Welcome everyone to Peripheral Perspectives a series of four colloquia on every Friday in July during the Porto Design Biennale 2021. This is a rare opportunity uh, to raise some radical voices in design, much needed in this binary populist world of contemporary politics. The aims of this series of colloquia are very simple, to bring together interdisciplinary academics, thinkers, diverse practitioners and citizens, to dialogue, to disturb, activate, and generate difference in the Deleuzean sense of newness beyond the existing power structures and regimes. In other words, to contest the status quo and its norms. The third aim is to embrace diversity through pluralistic ways of knowing, being, and most importantly, acting. Recently, COVID, the disease of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was referred to as a breaching experiment, a term coined by the sociologist Harold Garfinkel in 1967, defining an experiment that studies people's reactions as social norms are violated, as interaction is disorganized, and therefore assumed but invisible structures are challenged. Other sociologists point to the politics of pandemics, the political processes and politicking that underlie public health decisions, a paper by Capereri and Ross, 2020. And the world also shaped by the politics of pandemonium, wild, noisy disorder or confusion, often utilized to maintain or seize power. Another recent paper, Santiago and Smith, 2020. Furthermore, sociologists recognize that COVID is a crisis of social injustice and a breaching experiment itself to financial capitalism and neoliberal governance, and I would add other forms of governance too. I therefore see a design biennale, especially this Porto Design Biennale 2021, as a perfect opportunity to materialize difference with others challenging social norms, injustice, and the failure of so-called progress through 500 years of financial capitalism, named recently by Jason Moore in 2016 as the Capitalocene, not the Anthropocene, a multi-species assemblage, a world ecology of capital, power, and nature. Design materializes, visualizes, and communicates through gifting embrained, embodied, and emotional prototypes into the present. This potential for difference will, I am sure, be felt in these colloquia. I hope our collective perspectives and thoughts are challenged. And in doing so, we are motivated to produce and act differently. Or, to paraphrase Jacques Rancière, the philosopher, we together can change the distribution of the sensible and therefore challenge the aesthetic regime, and so challenge the politics of pandemics and pandemonium. And now before I finish, I'd really like to give some special thanks. This has been a, a fantastic collective work. So my first thanks are extended to the scientific committee. Uh, they uh, were arranged into the different colloquia. So for colloquia one, today's colloquia, heterox is a difference, I'd like to thank Alberto Altes, Luisa Maria Lopez Rivas, <laughs> Miguel Cavalais, got your full names there, Luisa, Rodrigo Hernandez Ramirez, 
And for the second colloquium, uh, Caring for Diverse Kinship, my thanks go to Ana Margarida Ferreira, Antonia Gorel Pinto, uh, Maria Milano, Paula Reich Pinto, and Tom Beeling. The third colloquium, Narratives of More Than Human Ecologies, I extend my thanks to Virginia Tassinari, Elena Freitas, Jose Bartolo, <coughs> Maria João Baltazar, Mariana Pestana, Tome Quadros. And for the final fourth colloquium, Animating Everyday Heterotopias, I give my thanks to Daniel Marcel, Ines Vega, and Maria Manuela Restivo. They all did a fantastic job to bring this colloquium together. And my final thanks go to the speakers uh, today and the future uh, colloquia, the moderators today, Luisa and Miguel, and warm thanks to the assistant curator of the colloquia, Joanna Casero, for her excellent support, and to the technical team who are just out of sight here at Ezad Idea and Ezad, Carlos Amaral, Rui Caldas, Bruno Mesquita, Renata Cruz Santo, and Renata uh, Materoni. Uh, a big thanks. And to the whole Biennale team. And now I think it's time that I hand over to the moderators for today, uh, Luisa Rivas and Miguel Cavalais, and just say enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alistair. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone. <laughs> and welcome to the first of the Peripheral Perspectives Friday right Colloquium. Uh, my name is mm -hmm. Luis Ribas, as Alistair said, and I'm from the Communication Design Department of the Faculty of Fine Arts of the University of Lisbon. And I'm here with my colleague, Miguel Carvalhais, uh, from the same department, but University of Porto, to moderate these talks. So first, we would like to begin by thanking our guest speakers for being with us today. Uh, to share their views on this panel, Heterodoxies of Difference, which we wanted to see discussed from the perspective of the current impact of digital computational technologies in, and the internet uh, in contemporary culture and society. So when Alistair proposed the topic, we could think of no better fit to it than the complementary views and modes of discourse and action of our invited speakers who are approaching issues such as the global implications of artificial intelligence or questioning how algorithmic governance and our immersion in the sphere of digital communications are changing and shaping our perceptions of reality. So we are eager to discuss their research and interdisciplinary design approaches and how they react to this contemporary condition. So we, would, we will have three talks of about 30 minutes each, followed by a collective Q&A at the end. Feel free to post your questions on the YouTube channel, and we'll try to place them at the end. We will begin with Kate Crawford, who is a leading scholar on the social and political implications of artificial intelligence and whose work focuses on understanding large-scale data systems, machine learning, and AI in the wider contexts of history, politics, labor, and the environment. And she will be talking about Atlas of AI, mapping the extracted logics of artificial intelligence. Then, Mackenzie Wark, who is a scholar on media and cultural studies and a prolific writer on media theory, critical theory, and new media, We'll be discussing the automation of the arbitrary. And finally, the collective Meta Haven will address their long lasting exploration of the notion of fiction within the realm of their interdisciplinary and collaborative practice that often intersects the hypothetical with the real. So I will now pass on to Miguel Carvalhais, who will give you a bit of context on our first speaker. And again, welcome and thank you. So, thank you, Luisa, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Kate Crawford, who is our first speaker today. By drawing on a decade, or more than a decade, of original research, Kate Crawford's most recent book, titled Atlas of AI, Power, Politics, and the Planetary Costs of Artificial Intelligence, is a detailed and very comprehensive work on the social, material, and political dimensions of AI, of the artificial intelligence that's dominating our, our world and much of our design. 
Atlas of AI gives us concrete examples of the plethora of usually hidden resources such as mining sites, factories, energy, vast collections of data that are necessary to make our AI work. It reveals how the global networks that underpin AI technology are damaging the environment, are entrenching inequality and are fueling a big shift towards undemocratic governance. As with much of Kate Crawford's research, this work ultimately questions how, under the guise of objectivity and neutrality, technical systems are actually designed to serve and to intensify existing systems of power. And it also shows how the new infrastructures of AI reflect the beliefs of the few with enormous costs for the many. So this way of keeping an eye on AI is also reflected on a role as a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research New York, at the FATE research group that is concerned with fairness, accountability, transparency and ethics in AI, as well as in her previous role as the co-founder of the AI Institute in the New York University. Uh, besides this, Professor Crawford has also advised policymakers in the United Nations, at the Federal Trade Commission of the USA, at the European Parliament, at the White House, and you know, all of these besides her roles as a research professor and visiting chair in several renowned institutions. So you may also be familiar with the writings at the New York Times, the Atlantic, Harper's Magazine and several academic journals. So finally, yet another really interesting part of Crawford's work includes the collaborative art and critical visual design projects such as the anatomy of an AI system that she developed with Vlad and Yoller, um, a project that maps the full life cycle of the Amazon Echo, and uh, more recent collaboration with Trevor Paglen to produce Training Humans, which was a major exhibition of the images used to train AI systems that was presented in 2019 at uh, Fondazione Pradas Osservatorio in Milano. Um, we are extremely happy and honored to have you with us today. So I give the stage to Professor Kate Crawford. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel, for that incredibly generous introduction. I'm going to try and share my screen here, so wish me luck. We'll see how we go. <laughs> this is going to be one of those beautiful moments. Hopefully, you can now see images. Um, yes. So, first of all, uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be joining you at the Porto Design Biennale, and in particular to be here with other folks that I've long admired, namely Mackenzie Walk and the Metahaven crew. My only wish is that we were doing all of this in person, but here we are in Zoom world. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where I'm joining from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I recognize their elders, past, present, and future. For those who aren't familiar with my work, uh, my name's Kate Crawford. I've been focusing on the uh, social, political, and ecological implications of AI for well over a decade, and have recently published this new book that Miguel mentioned called Atlas of AI. One of the underlying arguments of the book is that AI is the new emerging extractive industry of the 21st century. And in order to understand that, we need to look at the different sites where AI is made in the fullest sense. So for today's talk, I'm gonna share a little about the ideas behind the book, and then I'm going to explore some of the underlying dynamics of the wider political economy of AI and big tech. I'm going to address three sites of extraction in particular, deep time, deep tissue, and deep space. Or to put it another way, we'll consider the politics of rocks and brine because AI is made of minerals and fossil fuels. In deep tissue, we'll consider the politics of ligaments and sweat because AI is also made of human bodies. And finally, we'll go into deep space, which is the final frontier of AI's extractive practices. We can now see the effects of the design of large-scale computation in our atmosphere, the oceans, the Earth's crust, the deep time of the planet, and the brutal impacts on populations around the world. So let's start with a deceptively simple question. What is artificial intelligence? Well, if you type AI into Google image search, this is what you get. 
blue grids, floating numbers, men in glasses staring into the middle distance, uh, etched circuit boards, and lots of white robots. And of course, they're always white. This is a deeply problematic but very common framing of AI. It's all very abstract, ethereal, and immaterial. It's the ultimate view from nowhere in the cloud. But if we account for the full materiality of AI, we see that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. Rather, AI requires vast amounts of natural resources, energy, and human labor. It's a giant infrastructure project with logistical demands that span the planet. And in contradistinction to the idea of a disembodied brain, AI is not akin to human intelligence. Neither is it autonomous, rational, nor able to discern anything without computationally intensive training and predefined rules and rewards. In fact, the design of AI as we know it depends entirely on a much wider set of political and social structures. And due to the capital required to build AI at scale, AI systems commonly serve existing dominant interests, policing, the military, and the corporate sector. In this sense, AI is a registry of power. So for the Atlas of AI book, I wanted to leave this abstract nowhere of algorithms to really go and visit the specific somewheres where people and institutions make choices, from the US to Indonesia, Malaysia, China and the Congo, from toxic black lakes in present-day Mongolia to the extinction of entire species of trees in the Victorian era to produce submarine cables. And this is why I use the concept of an atlas. Atlases are, of course, unusual types of books. You can see things at different scales. You can look at a continent or zoom in to a mountain range. And I think we need these scalar shifts to truly understand something as vast as contemporary networked computation and information capitalism. But maps are also accounts of domination, where territory is carved along the colonial lines of empires. By invoking an atlas, I'm suggesting that we need new ways to understand the empires of AI. We need a theory of artificial intelligence that accounts for the states and corporations that drive it, the extractive mining that marks the planet, the mass capture of data, and the increasingly exploitative labor practices that sustain it. These are the shifting tectonics of power in AI, where the field is explicitly attempting to capture the planet in computationally legible form. And this is not a metaphor so much as the industry's explicit direct ambition. Now, a significant precursor for writing Atlas of A for me was this collaborative project that I did with Vladan Jola, where we mapped the entire life cycle of a single Amazon Echo, from the minerals to the data processing to the device disposal in the ground. That project was actually a much bigger research endeavor than either of us expected. We started by just looking at how echoes harvest data, but then went much further afield into supply chains, pay scales, smelting practices, and container shipping. And when we completed the project, I, I really wanted to expand this analysis from a single consumer device to consider the entire AI industry itself. So let's begin with the first extractive domain, deep time, and the politics of rocks and brine. To understand AI from the perspective of deep time, we need to begin from the Earth itself. This is one of the places that I visited, the unincorporated community of Silver Peak in Nevada's Clayton Valley. This mining town, which is one of the oldest in Nevada, was almost abandoned in 1917 after the ground was stripped bare of silver and gold. It wasn't until the 1950s that people realized that Silver Peak is in fact perched on the edge of a massive underground lake of lithium. Now the valuable lithium brine under the surface is pumped out of the ground and left in these open iridescent green ponds to evaporate. It's the only lithium mine currently operating in the US, and it makes it a site of extreme interest to Elon Musk and the other tech tycoons for one reason, rechargeable batteries. Because here, in a remote pocket of Nevada, is where the stuff of AI is being made. Lithium is also known as gray gold. Now, smartphone batteries, for example, take around seven grams of this material. The Amazon Echo has about double that. But each Tesla Model S car requires around 62 kilograms of lithium for its battery pack. 
Now, these kinds of batteries were never intended to supply a machine as power hungry as a car, but lithium batteries are currently all we have as a mass market option. And these batteries, of course, have a highly limited lifespan, they're very difficult to recycle, and are commonly discarded as waste. Clayton Valley, then, is connected to Silicon Valley in much the same way that the 19th century gold fields were connected to Silicon Valley. Gold and silver once enriched the city and funded its skyscrapers, and now to that list we can add white lithium crystal. Since antiquity, the business of mining has only been profitable because it doesn't have to account for its true costs, including land damage and the illness and death of miners and displaced communities. But if we go back to 1555, Agricola, the so-called father of mineralogy, observed that it was clear even then that the greater detriment from mining was far more than the value of the metals it produces. So an easy calculus emerged, extract everything as quickly as possible. It became the move fast and break things of another era. But if we travel about 200 miles north of Silver Peak, we reach this building. This is the Tesla Gigafactory. Tesla is the number one lithium ion battery consumer in the world. It's estimated to use more than 28,000 tons of lithium hydroxide annually. That is about half of the entire planet's consumption. In fact, Tesla could more accurately be described as a business of batteries rather than a car company. Now, a 2020 study by the University of Augsburg in Germany modeled how much lithium we may have left to mine. On the most optimistic estimate, and assuming we begin best practice recycling, we see lithium being depleted a few years after 2100. But without best practices, severe shortages could begin as soon as 2040. And we're just starting to see an intimation of what this might be like with the current semiconductor shortage crisis. But of course, the mining that makes AI is both literal and metaphorical. The theorists Sandro Mazadra and Brett Nielsen use the term extractivism to look at all of the different forms of extractive operations across the supply chains of contemporary capitalism. The new extractivism of data mining encompasses and propels the old extractivism of traditional mining. Now, in his book, Geology of Media, the theorist Yossi Parika suggests that we think of media not as extensions of the human senses in the sort of Marshall McLuhan sense, but more as extensions of Earth. Because computational media now <clears throat> excuse me, participate in geological and climatological processes from the transformation of the Earth's materials into infrastructures and devices. Each object in the extended network of an AI system, from routers to batteries to data centers, is built using elements that required billions of years to form inside the Earth. In a single smartphone, there are in fact 75 mineralogical elements. That's around two thirds of the entire periodic table. So we can begin to see how on average a 21st century person is consuming 10 times more minerals as one in the 20th century. So from the perspective of deep time, we're extracting Earth's geological history to serve a split second of technological time. And this is all used to build devices like Androids and iPhones that have an average lifespan of a mere 4.7 years. All those devices end up here, buried in e-waste dumping grounds. Much of this waste, of course, used to go to China, but when China banned e-waste because of its toxic legacy, it's now sent to places like Thailand, Pakistan, and Ghana. This is why we need to look much further than the US and Europe to see the legacies of the tech industry. And there are, of course, many such sites, including the Sela in Bolivia, the richer site of lithium and thus a site of ongoing political conflict, as well as the Congo, Mongolia, Indonesia and the Western Australian deserts. These are the other birthplaces of AI in the greater geography of industrial computation. Put another way, AI is a mega machine in Lewis Mumford's sense of the word. It goes beyond databases and algorithms. It is metamorphic transforming the earth with manufacturing, transportation, and undersea cables, signals passing through the air, data sets produced by scraping the internet, and continual computational cycles. And just like forms of traditional mining, the data economy is premised on maintaining a state of ignorance. 
And this, of course, is what Hart and Negri meant when they talked about the dual operation of abstraction and extraction in information capitalism. We abstract away the material conditions of production while extracting more information and resources. In this way, AI as a fundamentally abstract idea, when it is described as such, I think is designed to distance us from the energy and labor and capital needed to produce it. But let's move now to consider the human layer of AI computation, the deep tissue layer. Now, the common refrain is that we're living in a time of AI-human collaboration in workplaces. But of course, this collaboration is not fairly negotiated. I mean, do we ever get a choice to collaborate with algorithmic systems? So this is less of a collaboration than it is duress, where workers are constantly forced to reskill, to accept the latest platform and to acquaint themselves with new technological developments. Rather than developing, a, uh, even considering this as a sort of radical new shift, I think this encroachment of AI into the workplace should be contextualized in the much longer history of industrial labor exploitation. Since the 1890s, factory labor was increasingly subdivided into small actions to better suit machine cadences. So in some ways, we're witnessing a refrain on an old theme. The crucial difference is that employers now observe and modulate intimate parts of the work cycle and bodily data down to the last micro movements of our ligaments and facial expressions that were previously off limits. For example, in Jeff Bezos's shareholder letter in April, he shared a new vision of how Amazon will deal with the high levels of musculoskeletal disorders suffered by its workers in fulfillment centers. His solution is a new algorithm that will rotate employees through the space according to the muscle tendon groups that they use. This is surveillance into the deep tissue level and beyond. Bodies are a real problem in the AI augmented workplace. In fact, there was a recent survey by the New York Committee for Occupational Health and Safety, which showed that 66% of Amazon workers at a warehouse in New York were experiencing physical pain while performing their jobs, and 42% said that they were cont experiencing continual pain even when they weren't working. The worst sites being feet, lower backs, and knees. These are the skeletal hotspots of value extraction from bodies. Instead of, say, supporting unionization or creating a more sustainable working environment, Amazon has for years tried to create algorithmic solutions. Even so, we could look at the types of mechanical and even analog interventions as well. Back in 2018, as um, part of the Anatomy of AI project, Vladan Jola and I unearthed a little-known Amazon patent for a system to keep workers and robots in close proximity. It's this, a metal cage intended for workers that could be moved around the warehouse in the same motorized system that shifts all of the shelves filled with merchandise. So workers would be held upright in this cage, which at the same time constrains their movements so that they can better work with robots. Now, after we published this project, various news agencies started reporting on the cage. And then Amazon spoke to the press in an attempt to reassure people by stating that they never intended to build this particular cage. But the artist Simon Denny fortunately built a life-size physical model of the Amazon worker cage so that we can now see how this form of human AI collaboration might look. But of course, patents aren't necessarily meant to be built. Rather, they are maps of the corporate imaginary, a sort of speculative capture of possible designs for the future. Amazon has also patented this, augmented reality goggles that provide turn-by-turn -turn directions as you wear them, while also being able to track your walking speed, your dwell time, and your eye gaze at all times. This is very literally seeing through the lens of Amazon Corp. Here's another design imaginary. Another problem for Amazon is the time that it takes to pick and pack multiple items in a warehouse, which requires a lot of walking. And this is something that I saw in person when visiting Amazon fulfillment centers for the purposes of researching the book. And I could see the amount of worker injuries and exhaustion from the physical and psychological stress. Amazon has now patented aquatic storage facilities to create new ways of ordering space. Liquid-filled environments like the ocean or 
you know, artificially created ones, would allow for packages to be stored and retrieved in a more efficient way. Depth control devices determine how buoyant each package would be and would allow them to be stacked in layers and tracked by sonar. As we can tell, every element in Earth's environment is being maximized for efficient storage space for the world's biggest logistics company. So at a fundamental level, these ideas of controlled efficiency aren't new. Charles Babbage is well known as the inventor of the first mechanical computer in 1820, the difference engine. But Babbage also saw himself as a bit of a social theorist who wrote extensively on the nature of labor. In his most speculative writing, he argued that industrial computation could be understood as an analog to computers. Just like a computer, factories have multiple specialized units that all coordinate. He imagined perfect flows of work through the factory that could be visualized as data tables and monitored by pedometers and clocks. Through this combination of computation surveillance and labor discipline, Babbage wanted to enforce ever higher degrees of efficiency and quality control. Now for Babbage, the value of the factory was derived from its design of a manufacturing process rather than the labor force of the employees. The real innovation then was the logistical process. Workers were more of an afterthought. For Babbage, labor was generally a negative presence. Workers would fail to perform their tasks, they got sick, they would break down, or they protested. Only machines could be trusted. In Simon Schaefer's words, for Babbage, factories looked like perfect engines and calculating machines like perfect factories. I think this is a pretty good description of Amazon's vision and business model as well. Among the first industries to implement Babbage's vision of mechanized production was the Chicago meatpacking industry in the 1870s. Trains brought livestock to the stockyards, animals were funneled towards their slaughter in adjacent plants, and the carcasses were transported to various butchering stations by means of an overhead trolley system, forming what came to be known as the disassembly line. So when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, this novel which is a harrowing account of working class poverty, he set it in the meatpacking plants of Chicago. His intended point was to highlight the hardships of the working poor in support of a socialist vision, but in fact the book had an entirely different effect. The depictions of diseased and rotting meat prompted a public outcry over food safety and resulted in the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. But the focus on workers was entirely lost. Powerful institutions were totally prepared to try new designs for food safety, but not to address the more fundamental exploitative labor dynamics. Now we can see this pattern play out over centuries, how power responds to critique. Whether the product is cow carcasses or facial recognition, the response is to accept regulation at the margin, but to leave untouched the underlying logics of production. So what is the latest extension of these practices of extraction beyond earthly resources and human bodies? Well, now it's space extraction, where the mine that sustains the tech sector extends into the solar system itself. This is the politics of asteroid mining and deep space colonization. The ideology of these space spectacles is deeply interconnected with that of the AI industry. Extreme wealth and power generated by technology companies is now enabling a small group of men to pursue their own private space race. Basically, tech billionaires are now competing to see who can leave the planet first. There's a striking promotional video that Jeff Bezos's space company called Blue Origin published, and, and I think in some ways it reveals the thinking behind the privatized space race. You can hear Bezos's voice describe it in a voiceover, and I'm just going to quote from it here. This is the most important work I'm doing. It's a simple argument that this is the best planet, and so we face a choice. As we move forward, we're going to have to decide whether we want a civilization of stasis. We will have to cap population and cap energy usage per capita, or we can fix that problem by moving out into space." End quote. In the near term, Blue Origin is building reusable rockets and lunar landers at this suborbital base in West Texas. By 2024, the company wants to be shuttling astronauts and cargo to the moon. 
But in the longer term, the company's ambition is actually much grander. They want to bring about a future in which millions of people are living and working in space. Specifically, Bezos has outlined his hopes to build giant space colonies where people will live in floating manufactured environments. Heavy industry would move off planet altogether, while Earth would be zoned for some residential building and light industry, left as a beautiful place to visit, unquote, presumably for the people who can afford it when they're not working in the off-world colonies. Now, if all of this sounds oddly familiar, it's because Bezos's inspiration for conquering space comes in part from the science fiction novelist Jared K. O'Neill. Now, O'Neill wrote The High Frontier in 1976, which is this fantasy of space colonization, which, which is filled with these lush illustrations of moon mining with this kind of Rockwellian abundance. Bezos's plan for Blue Origin specifically name checks O'Neill as an inspiration for building permanent human settlements in space. Now, interestingly, if you go back, uh, O'Neill's fiction was inspired by his own dismay over when he read the 1972 landmark report by the Club of Rome called The Limits to Growth. This report famously published data models that predicted that resources and population was likely to collapse in the year 2100. That is, unless the global policy agenda rapidly reduced the gap between rich and poor nations. In writing The High Frontier, O'Neill wanted to imagine a different way out of a possible no-growth future. He didn't like this idea of having to, uh, to end growth and redistribute resources. And by focusing on deep space, O'Neill redirected global anxiety during the 1970s oil crisis with these visions of serene space structures that would simultaneously preserve the status quo. If Earth doesn't have enough surface area, O'Neill wrote, then humans should simply build more. Or we might say today, if we face shortages of key minerals or the climate threatens business, simply move extraction further out into space. That space colonization and frontier mining have become the common corporate fantasies of tech billionaires, I think underscores a fundamentally troubling relationship to Earth. The language of the tech elite now echoes settler colonialism directly, seeking to displace Earth's population and capture territory for mineral extraction. The billionaire space race similarly assumes that the last commons, outer space, can be taken by whichever empire gets there first. This is despite the main convention currently governing space mining in the US, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which recognizes space as a common interest to all mankind and that any exploration or use should be carried on for the benefit of all peoples. But of course, back in 2015, Bezos's Blue Origin and Musk's SpaceX lobbied the Obama administration to enact the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. It extends an exemption for commercial space companies from federal regulation, which allows them to own any mining resources extracted from asteroids and keep the profits, a whole new enclosure of the commons, if you will. So it's perhaps no surprise that many of Silicon Valley's tech elite are now invested in abandoning the planet, the desire to escape both climate collapse and regulation, no doubt. Space colonization fits very well aside the other fantasies of life extension dieting, blood transfusions from teenagers, brain uploading to the cloud, and vitamins for immortality. It becomes a whispered summons for all of us to join them as ubermensch to exceed the boundaries, biological, social, ethical, and ecological. But as Mackenzie Walk has asked, and will be no doubt speaking shortly, should we think of this as any way fundamentally different to late stage capitalism as beyond the usual dystopias of the Silicon Valley imagination? Or could it be something much worse? If we need a new design ethos, it is to build an alternative terrestrial vision with different modes of ecological homeostasis to create what Achille Mbembe calls a different politics of inhabiting the earth, of repairing and sharing the planet, or what J.K. Gibson Graham describes as ethical coordinates for a new kind of interdependence between humans, non-humans, and ecologies. 
If that sounds too grand or abstract, perhaps a simpler first step is simply making sure that all billionaires that go into space can't come back. You might have seen that over just the last week, 20,000 people signed a petition to not allow Jeff Bezos re-entry to Earth. <laughs> and this, of course, has now become one of the top petitions on change.org's site. So maybe the alternative future we need is something quite prosaic, although certainly not easy to achieve. We just need to find a way to live within the capacities of the planet we are on and resist the tired, phallic spectacles of the new colonial frontier and AI techno-solutionism. After all, those dreams were never designed for us. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Professor Crawford, for, for this amazing presentation that will certainly inspire many questions and hopefully also a lot of critical thought on contemporary AI. Um, I'd like to remind everyone watching this on YouTube that uh, you can send us your questions to us so that we can introduce them later in the Q&A after the three presentations. Unfortunately, because Professor Crawford is in Australia, she will not be able to stay for the Q&A. But I will now introduce our second speaker, Professor Mackenzie Walk, uh, whom I thank again for being with us very early in the day in New York City. Um, we can start by introducing Mackenzie Work with Kate Crawford's own words about the book Capital is Dead, Is This Something Worse? that was published uh, in 2019. Um, and this book addresses a feral form of commodification that walks amongst us. And um, as Kate Crawford says, quote, whether it is feasting on the remains of capital or hunting on its behalf, uh, this is a question Mackenzie Work is perfectly equipped to investigate. Uh, consider this book your exploratory field guide to a new mode of production. So, end of quote. So, providing us with field guides or theoretical tools to understand the current state of the world is something that Mackenzie Work is particularly apt and keen to do, uh, not only in the most recent Sensoria, Thinkers for the 21st Century, that was published last year, um, where she surveys key thinkers and ideas in areas of critical thinking, such as media ecologies, post-colonial ethnographies, and the design of technology, uh, but also in some of other her other works, such as Gamer Theory, uh, which uncovers the significance of games as an utopian version of the world in which we actually live in, uh, or in particular, um, one of, well, a favorite of mine, which is a hacker manifesto from 2004, where she introduces the hacker and vectorialist classes and their struggles um, to reveal a new complex mechanism for usurping power that is based on accumulating property and exploiting it. So some of these ideas are revisited in Capital is Dead, namely ideas about how the ownership and control of information has given rise to a new kind of ruling class that dominates not only labor, but also capital as traditionally understood. So, given these insightful overviews of, uh, of our condition, Mackenzie's work has been described as challenging the value systems of internet culture uh, when she was awarded the Thoma Prize for Digital Art Writing in 2019. So, work is a professor of culture and media at Eugene Lang College, uh, which is the undergraduate liberal arts division of the New School in New York City. Uh, she has published extensively, and just to mention a few more of, uh, of her works, she edited a special issue of the Flux Journal on Trends and Fem Aesthetics. Uh, this was earlier this year. Uh, she wrote a fictional autobiography, uh, Reverse Cowgirl, in 2020, and there's an upcoming book on Kathy Acker, <laughs> Philosophy for Spiders, that's coming this fall. With this in mind, let's hear Mackenzie Ward's view on the automation of the arbitrary. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for that very uh, fulsome introduction. I hope you can uh, all hear me. I've had some technical challenges uh, connecting today. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. I, I first wanted to uh, acknowledge I'm actually in Cape Cod at the moment, a place that settlers have named after a resource that they could extract from it, uh, but which is actually the unceded territory of the uh, Norsed people uh, here in uh, northeast of the United States. It is worth pointing out that 
uh, often these technical systems don't actually work. Uh, and, and we're kind of constantly encouraged to think of them as, uh, uh, or ever more refined, ever more perfected. But maybe it's worth paying attention to the uh, accident and the flaw and the failure, and the particular kinds of failure the technical systems actually uh, embed and embody. As Paul Verlier used to say, it's it's the, uh, the accident is central to what a particular technics ever actually does. And of course, the accident that we're now uh, all inside of is is climate crisis. That's one of the reasons it's a little difficult for me to to be here today. Uh, all right, so I wanted to pick up uh, uh, a little bit on uh, the material Kate gives to whatever this mode of production is that we're in now, uh, and to think through what happens when you are uh, harnessing all of those. Uh, resources, uh, both resources of uh, the physical worlds, uh, of human labor, of other species we could add as well. Uh, to what extent does the planet become a kind of giant plantation uh, in Anna Singh's sense of kind of extracting uh, also from uh, uh, other forms of living matter, the service of uh, management and control through information. And I wanted to focus a little bit more on the information bit of that and on the, the strangeness of information, a relatively new uh, concept. The word information is not new in uh, European languages, but maybe the concept of it is when we start to have a concept of what information might be, um, you know, maybe in the 1940s uh, with Shannon and Turing and so forth. It's a thing that you could measure, quantify, uh, design. And so what does it mean to have a political economy that, or if, if it even is a political economy, and, and, political economy anymore that runs on information and hence that, that was why I ended up uh, writing uh, Hacker Manifesto which came out in 2004 or uh, Capitalist Dead came out a year or so ago uh, to think through if you shift the political economy into control through information maybe that's a stage past whatever we thought capitalism was uh, so the the sort of premise of that work is, you know, what if this isn't even capitalism anymore, it's something worse? Then how would one think about uh, the sort of political, social uh, survival possibilities within that space, if it's if no longer quite answerable to the uh, languages and logics that we thought we understood uh, when this was capitalism? Well, what would be the difference and why is information so special? Uh, there's a way in which it's a kind of uh, layer of materiality that uh, is able to control all of the others in ways that were maybe not uh, formally possible, partly to do with speed, uh, the speed with which resources can be managed and controlled on a global scale. We've see, we see how that uh, evolves over the last um, 30, 40 years or so. Uh, the uh, Kate mentioned supply chains, whereby one can in real time know what's in the supply chain, uh, its quantity, its velocity, its destination, the number of views, and so forth. One can move things within the supply chain. Uh, one can, with financial instruments, manage not only the uh, current configuration of what's in a supply chain will end up being turned into, but all of the other possible ones, which is essentially what derivatives do, so that we're sort of running a game on every possible version of the outcome of the combination of all of these resources uh, in real time uh, and spending a considerable amount of energy doing that. So I don't know, maybe it's no longer capitalism and maybe it depends uh, on uh, ways in which novelty and in information in the design of information can be produced in such a way that that will then uh, extract resources out of all of the other layers of materiality uh, that are planetary. So information is not a sort of non-existent thing. It's not the ideal. It's very, very material uh, and takes more materiality to actually uh, put in control than you could ever possibly imagine. So yeah, that was I started to think maybe we needed a different language to think through whatever it is that we're in now uh, and to think, think it in terms of how ownership of um, uh, it's, it's I, I love Kate's idea of um, uh, patents as a glimpse into the kind of corporate imaginary 
Uh, what is it that you would kind of imagine this new forms of control? Uh, and here we see the kind of uh, product of that in those particular devices of Amazon's in terms of how you would, uh, uh, you know, what what once you have control over uh, uh, information flows, uh, information as uh, resource, information as vector, uh, what kinds of control of resources, including the human, does that then make possible? Uh, we're told there's uh, a logic to the design of an economy around uh, information as control. Uh, but what if what is automated is, at the end of the day, completely arbitrary? It was the question I wanted to sort of add uh, in this particular forum. So that I titled this piece, Automation of the Arbitrary. Uh, and there's a sense in which uh, there's a kind of attempt to ideologically make AI uh, a thing that in, is, is imagined a little bit like a market, but a little bit in place of it as the thing that knows better than the rest of us, how resources are to be allocated, who or what should be, be rewarded. Uh, but what if, as we sort of discover with markets, there's something arbitrary about the outcome of that? And it's partly related to whatever the inputs were in the first place. And I uh, uh, point people to uh, Jackie Wang's work on uh, what she calls carceral capitalism. Uh, when you start to apply uh, AI to policing, if the data that went into it was the old racist policing system, it's no surprise that the new policing system is just as racist. Uh, and where the criteria for success of algorithmic uh, uh, policing uh, end up being completely arbitrary in whatever the people trying to sell these products to police forces sort of say it is. So if it's convenient to say that an increase in arrests is success, then it is. Or maybe sometimes a decrease in arrests is success, and there that is as well. Uh, we're unlikely to know um, what actually changed, given that these are proprietary systems that you're not really uh, allowed to study. Uh, so we sort of exempt uh, whole areas of decision making from uh, critical scrutiny, where you might even sort of benchmark whether these things work at all. So what if there was something sort of arbitrary about the political economic machine that's then using information as control? Uh, and, and we'd sort of know already that the outcome in the macro scale is completely irrational, given if we keep doing what we're doing, the climate will continue to collapse. Uh, these systems will break, end of civilization. Uh, it's, it's not a thing that people really want to discuss all that much. Uh, but I've attempted to suggest that uh, maybe there's some delight we could take in being in that moment when civilization ends, uh, because the new one is only ever built out of the ruins of the old one. Right? Uh, the, the problem or the constraint with that is uh, the climate may become uninhabitable before we get around to attempting to redesign whatever it is we could out of the pieces left in the ruin. So I'm sorry, but that's the, the pessimistic note I have to offer here. But how do we get to that impasse? And there's a way in which uh, a concept that may be central here, uh, and that's a sort of devilishly tricky one, is the concept of value. And to what extent are we building systems around uh, completely arbitrary desires that are kind of trapped within uh, fulfillment on the model of the commodity? Uh, that, that bears no relation to what one might think need could possibly be. Uh, you Marx split the idea of use value from uh, exchange value and argued for the dominance of exchange value over a use value. Uh, in Jean Badriad, there's the idea of a sign value that, that then is <laughs> over and above exchange value, which is over and above use value. So, you know, utility becomes... Uh, a thing that's entirely governed by the sort of arbitrary fluctuating desire of individual consumers. Would there be a way to rethink uh, need and would there be a, a way to rethink desire as, as within that space as well? Uh, we end up kind of trapped in what else I call a kind of a game space where uh, one is encouraged to think one's desires competitively in relation to others. Uh, so whatever it is that I want uh, is 
uh, framed on on the one hand by envy. We're supposed to envy the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezos's of the world. Do not ever mention the name Elon Musk in like online forums. Sort of fanboys just descend on you to to defend the values and vision of their god. It's it's truly it's sublime and weird when that happens. Uh, so I, are we to you know uh, thinking? To- of uh, desires that are framed in terms of lack of things we don't have that someone else have so that we then have to struggle against those individuals uh, within kind of networks of visibility. Uh, where we're, we're kind of, and, and the kind of uh, mental health stress that seems to result uh, from trying to operate in that world is not really doing anybody uh, any favours to the physical injuries uh, of the Amazon worker, you could add the uh, psychological industry in injuries of continually being uh, uh, in this mode of thinking one's desires as in relation to individual fulfillment. Uh, it's interesting to me that in the English language, we talk about fulfillment centers as being where all of that uh, uh, incredibly controlled labor happens. So the fulfillment of individual desires requires the organization of the workforce that may at some point be living in cages so as not to uh, uh, interact improperly with machines. Uh, all right, so other aspect of this would be uh, then to what extent does the kind of information political economy not only uh, extract desire uh, as one of the uh, things that will then shape in terms of its needs, the arbitrary need that desires fit the form uh, in, in which those desires can be can be uh, full. Uh, to what extent is there a kind of collapsing differences that are measurable uh, in terms that uh, artificial intelligence can capture uh, and that uh, algorithms can uh, then present to you an array of possible things that might fulfill uh, a particular need. But the difference is always framed by the sameness of being a commodity that can be delivered uh, and where one appreciates its qualities only in relation to all of the other choices. Uh, you look when you're shopping on your screen and there's you can have that one or you can have it in these colors or this other one that's slightly different. Uh, so difference gets collapsed into sameness. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a way in which uh, uh, not only any kind of human difference, but, but difference in the larger sense in the world uh, is then only thinkable within a framework of uh, extraction of resource uh, and the meeting of a desire uh, with whatever is extracted from those resources uh, and through the kind of super exploitation of labor. Then also the labor of whatever it is, people like designers or uh, 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 college professors what exactly is our labor even that system do we also then form a kind of class who are not so much performing the repetitive action of a labor as designing what it is that labor will end up doing so how are we implicated as a class that produces new information that is the sort of design template for uh, the kind of repetitive labor of manufacturing the semblance of difference to kind of meet a whole series of artificial desires uh, the net result of which is kind of a collapse of the whole the whole system <laughs> that billionaires will have fled uh, by going off into space. So that's where we are. Um, within that, um, what space is there then for whatever you might think of as uh, the anomaly? There's a way in which our own particular human differences end up being uh, illegible, and that also might be a sense of uh, distress, tension, uh, a, a kind of incapacity to, to function as legible in one's own right. And the particular categories of people who experience that uh, most directly. I'll just talk about the experience of being uh, a transsexual woman, like confronting a whole series of screens and interfaces and so on. Uh, if I go to my uh, uh, doctor, my chart says that I'm a postmenopausal. Uh, uh, hormone readings are continually in the red and completely wrong <laughs> because there is no category for me uh, in that piece of you know corporate design medical software whatsoever there's no category for trans woman uh, so I'm put into a different category uh, that doesn't fit and so it makes certain kinds of medical results look like they're anomalies 
uh, when to my body they're actually not. Uh, or think about the Facebook ads that uh, uh, that I now get. We all get if you're on some social media. Uh, uh, an algorithm has decided these are the range of things you might want to desire. Um, it was interesting that Facebook knew I was coming out before I announced it and started changing what it advertised to me. Uh, and we sometimes think there's some spooky intuition that artificial intelligence has about what we might want uh, and, and what it will present to us, that it's sort of like secretly listening to us. Who knows? Maybe it is. Uh, but then maybe there's also uh, a way in which it's sort of simply guessing at the kind of things that you think you ought to want and presenting those to you. Uh, so Facebook decided I wanted a whole bunch of like really slutty lingerie uh, after I became a woman. It was like, really? <laughs> that's that's how you see me? That's how you perceive me? And Facebook can actually drill down and look at the categories advertisers have kind of put you into. I think, ah, so the what I am in that universe is this uh, matrix of possible desires and that's it. I have no other uh, existence within that, the framework of that uh, uh, kind of uh, frame of deciding what kind of person I am in the same way that when going to the doctor, oh, like I, I can only be one of these things. Uh, there's no way to exist other than as uh, a kind of selection from a series of presets. So it feels like being, uh, if you like, a non-player character uh, in a game sometimes. I'm sure we all have that experience. It feels like we're being played rather than playing. Uh, and, and we sort of see everything through the surface of the interface. Uh, but the interface then hides and is designed, of course, to hide the kind of layers all the way down to the extraction of a resource uh, that's a mineral or an animal product on the one side. But the interface is also designed to hide the extraction from us of the resource of information that we're now encouraged to offer up even for free. Uh, one of the things that was distinctive about uh, capitalism was that wage labor was wage labor. Labor was paid. Uh, and of course, capital, like other extractive modes of production before it, uh, always needed free or cheap inputs uh, in order to, you know, land had to be stolen, the forest had to be cut down, and so on. Uh, and labor had to be exploited. Um, but maybe what's being exploited now is not so much just our labor, but I'd even uh, ha hazard to say our communism, the desire we all have to be together, to share from, with each other, to learn from each other. Even that is a thing that can now be incorporated and not paid for in any monetary sense, but paid for uh, with sort of smidgens of the satisfaction of the desire to be present with others and so forth. So maybe what we're inside is like capitalism in some ways and there's a layer of it that is that um, but folds it into uh, the control of information the extraction of information uh, and where that then shapes the extraction of everything on a planetary scale uh, to a form that's exceeded whatever capitalism was in its ability to um, control, exploit, uh, manage and direct desire. So I'm starting to sound a little bit like uh, the Marcuse of One Dimensional Man, right? The thing is that you might notice social movements found a way past that. Uh, and uh, by the late 60s, Marcuse's early 60s vision of uh, complete enclosure uh, within commodification seemed like it was possible uh, to exceed that, to produce social movements beyond it. So I, in that sense, I hope I'm wrong. And there's a way in which, um, when I wrote Gamer Theory, I was very interested in that kind of complete enclosure uh, in a kind of planetary game space. Uh, but maybe one could think about uh, where social movements are that might uh, exceed that. And uh, let's be frank, maybe in the West. Uh, maybe not in what those situations called the overdeveloped world. We might have to look elsewhere for a kind of exceeding uh, of the constrained space of desire, possibility, uh, uh, and need. That's the, the kind of commodification of information and through that, the commodification of everything else. So that's about as good as I can get as a, on an optimistic note. Uh, although I, I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't show you slides. I just put this in the set last night. 
uh, and then uh, uh, technically I'm unable to share them. Uh, there's a lovely story I saw on social media yesterday of, of a Tesla with no driver in it driving around a parking lot on fire uh, because somehow the it was it was sort of managing to drive itself, uh, uh, but it was on fire and the driver was absent. But that seems to me to be a kind of perfect, uh, if one wanted an image of where we've ended up, that maybe would be it. Uh, the Tesla was on but fully in and can about what uh, to fully, uh, use and inhabit uh, this enclosed landscape to uh, propose another one that might be enduring, that might be habitable, that uh, might actually meet basic human needs, that might actually treat desire as one of those basic needs uh, outside of the framework of uh, commodification. So we'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Wark, for, for this wonderful and, and thought-provoking presentation and also for leaving us with the idea of the Tesla driving in circles <laughs> whilst on fire. Um, <laughs> so, once again, I remind everyone watching through YouTube that we will have some time for a discussion after the, the three presentations, so please send us questions if you have any uh, so that we can introduce them in the Q&A after the, the following, the next presentation. Uh, and to introduce Meta Haven for the final presentation of today's session, I will now pass on to Luisa Rivas. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you so much to our previous speakers uh, for their wonderful talks. Um, and of course, to our next one, who I'm very pleased to introduce. Uh, even though I think for the designers among the, the audience, Meta Haven don't really need an introduction, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, there's no simple way of describing their role as key thinkers and practitioners uh, within and beyond, uh, beyond the realm of design. We can say that Meta Haven have a truly peripheral perspective on the field. Their work crosses filmmaking, writing and design projects that reflect on technology, political and social issues. And their early works, uh, from the speculative visual identity of the Principality of Sealand, designed to exist only on the internet, to their study on the visual identity of Wikileaks, explored potential spaces of ex uh, exception to geopolitical jurisdiction, and were followed by verbal and audiovisual essays on information democracy like black transparency. And in the meantime, they managed to write a somewhat prophetic essay, Can Jokes Bring Down Governments? So gradually, they started engaging in other forms of narration and world making that were more attuned to the way information is conveyed online through moving images. Um, and among their many inspiring texts, their publication, Digital Tarkovsky, reflects uh, the online experience of social networks as a slow cinematic procedure. One of their best known works uh, of this shift towards moving image is uh, The Sprawl, Propaganda About Propaganda, which responded to a commission to address the internet as a weapon of mass disruption. And this resulted in an episodic online fiction documentary an online platform that considers the way in which fantasy can be designed so as to seem or feel like a truth, as Daniel van der Velden puts it. So as a purely fictional sequel to the sprawl, Information Skies develops like a fantasy-driven speculation of an imaginary world in the near future that reflects on how communication tools affect our processing of reality. And often wrapping facts in fiction and fiction in facts, subsequent films like Hometown or Eurasia create an atmosphere of permanent epistemic uncertainty in layered and non-linear cinematic forms, which are often presented as installations and which the most recent work, Chaos Theory, gives continuity to. But I will not go for long, and I will just add that you can find a very enlightening view of their work in the recent publication PSYOP, an anthology designed by Meta Avon and co-edited by Karen Archie, 
which was public on the, published on the occasion of their solo exhibitions, Earth and Version History, at the Static Museum in Ast Amsterdam and the Institute of, of Contemporary Arts in London. So with no further delay, I now give the screen to Daniel van der Velden, whom I thank again for being with us today. Thank you so much, Luisa. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here uh, with the uh, Porto de Zambianale and with uh, these great uh, and amazing fellow speakers, uh, Kate and Mackenzie, uh, both whose work we really love um, and admire. And it's, of course, uh, very big shoes to fill to come after these two speakers. So uh, the perspective that, that, that we will offer will, will hopefully uh, you know, bring some um, things that have not been sort of like previously covered, perhaps. So I want to, uh, without further ado, I want to show my screen like, so can you see my, this kind of slide deck now? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So the, the title is Fictions. Um, <clears throat> and I, 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 while listening to Kate and, and Mackenzie, I, I came up with another title uh, that was Art Inhabits Whatever Is Left. So that was sort of the other title I thought about when, when listening to the previous talks. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about research interests first before moving to showing our actual uh, works. Uh, I do want to say one thing about a biography and about being defined by previous works, and that is that our own perception of what we do, you know, always, you know, necessarily is probably a little bit ahead of what people know that we're doing. Uh, so the, the notion of, um, you know, stuff like geopolitics and, uh, you know, the internet and stuff like that is, is stuff that we have engaged with for, for, for a long period of time, but I, I wouldn't say that's what defines our work right now. Uh, so I want to talk first about artistic strategies, you know, I want to really talk about the role of art in this whole complex, you know, and particularly the notion that art uh, does not illustrate or demonstrate these technological developments, and at the same time that art is, uh, you know, sort of like interdependent on these developments. So I think that artists, when they're confronted with uh, phenomena that mm, have this massive scale, you know, the first thing that you're thinking about is that art is not conveyed primarily only through things that deal with scale. You know, art is about a whole bunch of other stuff that we can talk about and that are very ephemeral if you compare them to, let's say, something like, or they, that appear very ephemeral if you if you if you can uh, compare it to something like a lithium mine, you know. And, and both are important. Art is important, but the talking about the lithium mine is also important. Let alone doing something about this situation of extractive uh, capitalism or something worse. Um, so one thing I wanted to recall is something I read in the, New York, in the London Review of Books the other day that our friend Flavia Zodon pointed us to when we were chatting the other day. And it's actually something where we will quote Elon Musk. And I was planning to not quote Elon Musk or not to talk about Musk or Bezos at all because not, well, they have been talked about and they have even been shown. Why add to that? Well, I want to talk about this because there is an implication to these tech that let's say technological developments that are in fact operative um, political ideologies where feelings and emotions are invoked and we are sort of thinking about where these will go. So I'll just quote you a short bit from an article from the London Review of Books that was published a few actually like a week ago or something. Elon Musk claims to believe that in 10 years speech will be obsolete. Tiny chips planted in the human brain will instead allow humans to communicate entirely with their minds. I want to add to that that we've just heard from Kate that there is a shortage of semiconductors. So where those semiconductors should come from, in addition to all the others that are needed to bring us human humankind to space, is for is now a mystery. But let's assume that this is what what will be technologically possible. Never want to shy away from a grandiose proclamation, Musk describes his latest venture, Neuralink, as conceptual telepathy. There's a lot of information lost when compressing a complex concept into words, he explained. The link promises to erase such inefficiencies by removing speech from the equation. But such reasoning is only compelling if you think smooth communication is the sole purpose of language. 
And then Musk says that humans will soon speak only for sentimental reasons. And I end my quote here. Uh, and that's the last time you'll hear about Musk in this presentation. But I just want to have said this to, to talk about the fact that this is sort of like really wrapped up with what art is about. And that's why I think it struck sort of with me. So I'm, I'm listing here a bunch of stuff that may seem very, very abstract, uh, but that is nevertheless what we're dealing with right now in our own research, which leads to, uh, I think as Luisa explained, to mostly to moving image works right now at the moment, and also textile works, which I'll show a little bit, uh, some, uh, some of in a little bit. And one of these things that we're interested in is wrapping. Um, and wrapping thought about as a technique that is a, alternative for what you know you could call figure ground relationship and we're drawing with wrapping we're drawing really on a moment that frederick jameson a u.s uh, literary theorist uh, identified this in a 1989 book on postmodernism and he identified it more precisely with a the final scene of tchaikovsky's film nostalgia uh, of which that still is actually behind me so i'm just going to maybe well, I will move ahead uh, like to the side so you can see it. That's wrapping. You see like something is wrapped in something else. There's like this little building that's wrapped in the, in the bigger building. Right. So thinking from wrapping, we're interested also in recursion. The notion that um, a, like a function can use itself as an argument. So there is you know, the, the structure like a Russian doll, which is the, the same structure as the, the final scene behind me, is a case of wrapping, but it's also a case of recursion. That's something we're interested in. And recursion as a process central to cognition and the notion of tangled hierarchies that comes with that. Uh, so the idea that, that recursion that recursion is something that's central to the, the way that, that, our, that our minds sort of work in a way, that is something that interests us. Then we're interested in notions of recursion. And I know this all sounds very abstract, but I hope you know, I can unpack it a little bit later versus essentialism. You know, things described as functions of themselves, things described as um, functions that take themselves as arguments versus things that are described according to a so-called hidden essence. Um, from that point of view, because we're very interested in sentiment, we're very interested in the relationship between sort of sentiment, recursion, um, essentialism, and also in art objects, transitional objects, such as the ones that children hold, like um, comfort animals and stuff like that. Um, apart from the notion of what is the transition for or between, uh, these objects acquiring recursively constructed rather than essentialist meanings. This may sound entirely ephemeral when we're just heard about space rockets and whatnot, but this is something that interests us. Absurdism, autopoiesis, poetry and artificial intelligences. Obviously, there is a relationship between AI writing and, you know, the, the notion of poetry. Um, and that's something that interests us deeply. Uh, so far, we've researched it primarily through trajectorying, um, you know, certain strands of poetry uh, that are related to, on the one hand, children's songs, but on the other hand, also related to maybe the way that poetry once reacted to power by ridiculing it. We're interested in reality and fiction being wrapped structures rather than opposites. And this is something that I feel like is important to think about when we think about, you know, terms like, you know, post-truth and, and all that sort of stuff that our work has been sometimes associated with. I'm, I'm really not so uh, into these terms. I think about these structures, what much more as sort of wrapped structures where one inhabits the other rather than as looking like opposites. Although we all know that the truth is something different from a fiction, obviously. Uh, and then the notion of the politics of the envelope that are that exists after this process of wrapping and recursion. So in a sense, the future of the wrapper. Art and ethics after this notion of recursion, which I think is more interesting and more relevant than the notion of essentialism, which ascribes you know hidden essential identities to things. The, uh, we can we've done some experiments in our own let's say research practice where we've looked at how certain objects are recursively inscribed with characteristics rather than having these characteristics characteristics as essences. And finally, and this is where I link back to this notion of, um, uh, you know, 
the thing I just quoted, progressive sentimentalisms. That's something that interests us. So the, the weird thing, the thing is, I think that 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 art is often really not super capable of really dealing with uh, the questions that are on the table right now, and that's partially because art uh, does not. Uh, art collectively holds a form of power, but individually, the artists do often not, and. Um, they are all participating in some form of market economy in order to maintain these practices. So that is also sort of weakening what, what art is politically. Uh, but also art uh, is always about how these, you know, things that we talk about land ultimately in feelings and emotions. And that is something that is a very unpopular theme, let's say in art circles, because it's on the one hand so ephemeral, but, be, but also because there's such overarching associations with, um, you know, conservative claims that are attached to, you know, notions of um, the notion of beauty, the notion of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of like a lot of, a lot of things we should be talking about, we aren't talking about because we fear to touch some of the wrong buttons, rightfully so perhaps, but that's something nevertheless that we're interested in. So I think a lot of people know us as a design group. And so here are some of our sort of like publications and the people I think know us also for our design languages, visual languages, etc. Uh, most recently a book designed for the new book, Benjamin Breton called The Revenge of the Real, which deals with, which deals with the future of politics and governance after the pandemic. Uh, as the title sort of spells out for Verso books. Um, so there, we think of these books as families. So these books are not, you know, artifacts that are singular, but they're, they're, they, they're trajectories where, you know, one book suddenly reminds you of another one. So there might be, there's these sort of family relationships and in a way these, these family relationships are also about the, the relational practice that design also is because often you work for a much longer time with somebody. And then, as Louisa mentioned, there's The Sprawl, which was a 2015 film, our first long film about propaganda. Uh, and in this film, we started to first explore, let's say, some of the more uh, poetry or emotion, emotion or feeling or, or even sentimentality related strategies that are, that, are, that are now also foregrounded in our more recent, let's say, research. Uh, and um, I would say this was the last work that was reactive to certain you know, geopolitics, whatever. And I think that subsequent works have not been so reactive to, you know, what was going on in the world, but have much more talked about what, what is the, the narration, you know, by itself without taking into account that it refers to a lot of stuff that's going on in the world. And of course, music videos with Holly Herndon um, have also, you know, shown much more of the way that we think visually uh, and I think this is very, very, like, let's say a graphics heavy approach, but a lot of our more recent work is much less heavy on graphics and much more engaged with moving images as moving images or scenes as scenes or narrations as narrations. But as I just explained at the beginning, it's for the, the, the image of our practice is often really defined by the very early work. And uh, we know when a, when a practice develops, um, it's, it's often sort of like something that you feel, this is what we're about, this is what we're doing now, but not, not always is everyone like on the same page about that because people some, sometimes don't know. Um, so moving images um, and thinking about film adds the notion of the, 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 the accident and often the happy accident to the notion of design because you cannot design what a person does, right? So what a person does is always gonna be really different from what you wanted or what you hoped for. So designing, creating a film, thinking about what, what a story can be and what a character is always involves a whole bunch of stuff you didn't ask for. And that's actually why it's so it's exciting for us to do it because it's, you know, it's not associated with the notion of, con you know, with control that, you know, certain other notions of software bring with them. And then also films are ways to create environments. So we do not you know, necessarily uh, want to put people in a seat to watch a film. We, we want to create installations in which people can immerse themselves, sit on carpets, et cetera, and also not be bound to a film for its full duration, but be able to sort of walk in and out of that. And of course, we don't always have the luxury or the chance to do that because the COVID 
era, if it made one thing clear, it is that the idea of a distinct exhibition space that's just that, and that you expect everyone to go there, that is not something that is very sustainable anymore, right? We need to think about online showings in the same way and extending, you know, the physicality or the, the, the kind of like viscerality of an exhibition into a space where people can visit from, you know, from a distance. And I'm, I'm really, we're really excited about that, but it's of course difficult as well. Um, so I want to, you know, speak to the hybrid character of the films we do, et cetera, as a, as a way to also acknowledge that the work comes from graphic design at some point, you know, that some of the work we do in moving images is a little bit like a collage, but other stuff is not. Uh, right. And yeah, so, so I'm assuming that people don't, or maybe people know people, maybe people don't know, but it's just what we do and what we're, what we're interested in. And I, I feel that what, what I feel is interesting about film and art and design and everything is that it never, like when it's interesting, it's not an illustration or a demonstration of what these technologies are, but it's something more than that. It's something other than that. Something that also speaks to something else inside of us. And this is something I, I, I feel I'm almost hesitant to talk about, but I feel sometimes that the bigger, let's say, result of the, you know, the, the explosion of sort of like um, what is called post-truth or what is called like um, something like, you know, propaganda or um, uh, algorithmic feeds or whatever, you know, is that the result is the discrediting of fiction and not, not, necessarily, not necessarily the end of the truth. The, the result is partially the discrediting of fiction, fictional approaches that uh, that I feel is something that that sometimes runs you know missing here and and as as Louisa also said we've often used especially beginning of what we of our practice hypotheticals as ways to work from at a at a moment where hypotheticals and speculations were not commonly associated with you know the field of graphic design where we where we originally come from uh, so the idea of resources as Kate uh, invoked it in in her lecture is also something that's very present in in what we try to do with moving images, but we always, instead of talking about the research, we will hide a keyboard in, in the slag or something in a copper mine somewhere. And then we will play on the keyboard as a sort of guitar or something. So there's always transformations involved with what these things are, rather than let's say depicting them in a, in a, in a way that's sort of straightforward. Um, yes. so. Um, as Louisa mentioned, uh, we're interested in the cinematic uh, aspects of sort of everyday experiences and also interested in the way in which cinema intersects with um, other technologies that are not commonly associated with it. Uh, I mean, we talked about deep time or rather Kate talked about deep time and deep time is of, of course something that's also linked to the cinematic experience. Rather, you know, we could even say that deep time itself is a form of uncharted cinema uh, that, you know, we could think about becoming more receptive for through means of art. Uh, and in order to do such a thing, we would need to redevise also what a camera is, but also who is watching and things like that. And those are, of course, uh, questions that are quite big and they're not within the scope of a single work. Uh, or within the scope of one or two years to, to think about, but really something sort of longer term tropes. Um, and so, so as, you know, a practice that has been working for, you know, several years, et cetera, we've often, of course, been, have worked in the context of sort of thematic uh, shows, for example, or thematic invitations where, where art is supposed to talk about an issue directly. And, when I'm honest, I, I have to say that I'm, I've gotten more and more skeptical about the ability of art to really address things directly. I think that that is actually one of the advantages of art that it does not necessarily talk about things head on, but that it can talk about things through various forms of detour it, that are considering the, not so much the, the eventual content or meaning, but the way in which the content and the meaning are arriving with the, 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 the people who are interacting with the work. Mm. And I think that, that also 
creates the possibility to tell the same story across multiple media and not in a way of a multimedia installation or anything, but much more in a way of, of relating the same concerns or the same obsessions or the same desires through a multiplicity of media. In our case, definitely textile, embroidery and other media like that are involved in that as well. And um, and I wanted to say that maybe for the designers in the room, I'm not sure how many are here or how many are listening today, but there is there's always ways in which your work can answer, like when it doesn't answer one question directly, it might answer another question that maybe is one you haven't asked and sort of attuning your practice to these shifts or these ways that things are sort of really asymmetrical is also a way to, to, to think about these things. Mm. Right. I think that another thing that we like to do is, you know, as um, uh, as Louisa said, you know, explore this idea of, idea of the hypothetical, but also explore the idea of, you know, the kind of historical, uh, the way that, you know, often when people invoke a historical truth or something that's supposedly really happened, what they're doing is invoking a form of distortion or a form of fictionalizing, for example, the past. And uh, I, we live in Europe, so I'm speaking here from Amsterdam, and uh, Europe is, of course, a site of that. Europe is a site of continuous, um, you know, sort of almost neo-medieval nostalgias that are sort of over, overlapping one another. And one could really imagine what the map of Europe would look like uh, when that happens, and that's sort of like what this is. Uh, it's a work called DVD Zone, work called DVD Zone Five, which is named after the division of the different zones that are there for DVDs and where they can be played and not. And DVD Zone Five is largely overlapping Russia and the, and a few other countries. But it's so it's it's something that's uh, also is one of the kind of like administrative regions of of, of the digital space in a way, right? And I think finally, I want to, you know, say something about lyricality and the notion of that you work from things that you love and that you're enthusiastic about. And that is something that's also, I think, a very important value to, to, to keep in mind. I don't mean that in a naive way. I don't mean it in the sort of like graphic design is my passion type of way, as we, as, as we know the meme. But I mean it much more in the way that what you eventually do in your work and what you speak about and the things that you invoke are the things you probably uh, are, are things that should be important to you. So um, Information Skies is, that was mem shortly mentioned by Louisa is a piece about VR, basically a piece about people living their own bubble and that bubble sort of bursting, 2016. Um, and it was a piece where interface animation and a sort of, well, Tarkovskian or, or, or proto-Tarkovskian or post-Tarkovskian filmic, you know, language overlapped, of course, together with subtitles. Uh, subtitles for us are part of what a film is. They're not an overlay. They're really, they belong with the image. And recently we even made a sort of subtitle pavilion model. Um, and our most recent film, Chaos Theory, is a film about parenthood. And it's trying to talk about a little bit extending, I think, the notion of parenthood um, and uh, looking at that sort of in detail a little bit more, but also in a way that sort of self-fictionalizes and is really like sort of cyclic. And there's even split screens like Zoom in it with um, one, you know, with highlights, et cetera. So it's also influenced by the pandemic, but basically it's a relationship between, it's about the relationship between a parent and a child and how that, how that relationship unfolds and the different concerns that they have where the parent is quite serious to some level and the child uh, creates this very sort of imaginative trajectory through the film. So the, 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 the film does ask this question, what is present, what is physical, quite like joy itself. And I want to say this because the notion that art is sort of bound up with ever what is left, you know, when I think about uh, the future of AI and the future of computation, I also think about the future of feelings. And I don't mean that in a way that is trying to close the eyes to what to the reality, uh, like um, uh, art is not a form of looking away from from these issues, you know, art is a form is ultimately really a form of um, living through these issues. And um, so having said that, um, 
So these are a few stills from Chaos Theory. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing with time, actually. I think we're doing okay. But perhaps running towards the end with some notes. Um, so ultimately, they sleep on a solar panel. So that's that's a, that's the closing shot, closing sh scene, I should say. Um, two holes are even carrying the mid flight of fall, and there's also some entropy in there. Um, so I wanted to just come back to that thing about recursion because that is something that we're really interested in and what we're like currently doing and making. And I wanted to talk about the way that. Um, uh, this has been defined, you know, as a form of nesting and vari variations on nesting. So recursion consists of stories inside stories, movies inside movies, paintings inside paintings, Russian dolls inside Russian dolls, even parenthetical comments inside parenthetical comments. These are just a few of the charms of recursion. And, you know, as Jameson had said, you know, this is a replacement in a sense of the figure ground relationship. And sometimes recursion seems to brush paradox very closely. Um, like recursive definitions, where something is being defined in terms of itself. I want to, you know, quote a more recent example of a novel that um, we really, really like. Uh, it's Pharmaco AI by Kate Alada McDowell, um, in which uh, this is one of the books that responds to the pandemic in a way, or that is produced by the pandemic. But this book has been co-written uh, with an AI language model. And over the course of a fortnight, uh, the exchange rapidly unfolds into a labyrinthine exploration of memory, language, and cosmology. Of course, we can ask, you know, again, this question about uh, the future of feelings, or as Mackenzie, you know, also talked about future of desire, in a sense. The work mentions recursion at several instances in ways that involve what is commonly called narrative levels. So there is these sort of like tangled hierarchies that are being uh, wound together by this procedure. So I'm going to quote a little bit from uh, K. K. Aledo McDowell's book. Whose story is it? We assume a story has an author to whom the narrative belongs, but authors are observers too. Sometimes, sometimes a story is received, it is reproduced, it is copied. There's an impulse toward recursion, a tendency to transform a narrative enmeshed in one person's experience into an experience shared by more people. When a story is spread and spread widely, it can spread far. The character in the story experience a story now coming at him from more than one direction. A son calls his mother on the phone. As they talk, the mother thinks she hears him talking to another person in the background. Then the mother realizes that the voice she is hearing on the phone is the voice of another woman. The mother experiences this story as a recursion of the story of a marriage. Her story as a married woman, her husband's story, in some sense, she is both herself and her husband and the lover on the phone, but the mother does not experience herself as an embodied effective connection between her own sense of self and the other. She does not feel herself as an enmeshed connection to another person. Rather, the mother experiences herself as the space of a story she is telling to herself about what this story could mean to her. So that's not the final answer to the question about AI that the symposium is, 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 um, is asking, right? And I think there is no final answer. Um, everyone here is enmeshed and entangled with the, the, the very issues we're talking about. Uh, and, the, and so is art, no? So that's, that's the, the thing I wanted to have said today. And um, aside from ways in which art objects, films, et cetera, can complicate uh, these matters in a way that also invokes a relationship. And that's something I, I think we, Vinka and I really believe in. Um, so I wanted to repeat that art is not a form of looking away from these issues. Um, and finally, I wanted to quickly say that um, chaos theory because usually we get the question, where can we see your films? Chaos Theory is currently streaming on 43.boilerroom.tv as its sort of film uh, through July 4th. So if you want to watch it, that's where you can watch it at the moment. But we hope to bring it to you in other forms uh, and places as well soon. And thank you so much for listening after a dense one and a half hour or two hours. Mm, uh, and thank you again, yes.
Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for this <coughs> presentation. Um, uh, as you said, after this uh, one hour and a half already, but okay. we still have uh, half an hour for questions. Well, at, at least 20 minutes, let's say. So I will perhaps start, and uh, I would like to go back to your uh, to the beginning of your presentation and your idea that art, in, art inhabits whatever is left. And that actually makes a very nice resonance with Mackenzie's work's words uh, that uh, we picked up somewhere saying that digital art can tell us about the hidden possibilities for whatever, what everyday life could be outside of domination and control. So maybe the resonance between those tools, I would like to, uh, to pick up on that, is to see, to, for you to elaborate on how you react to this statement in relation to your practice. For example, uh, and perhaps first Daniel, about exploring alternate realities and potential futures as a way to either reveal hidden utopian possibilities or to expose the hidden dystopias or between uh, advocating possibilities or exposing or denouncing domination. Uh, because as you said, your, your first works were more reactive, but your subsequent works uh, have not been so reactive. So how do you move between these, uh, let's say, uh, poles? Thank you. Um... You know, I think that um, what I've become a little bit suspect about in art are grand claims, you know, like the idea that, you know, you can like cha change all these things by, you know, just making what doing what you do. I think that there's often there's there's uh, shared um, allegiances between artworks and practices that can form a change. I also think that art that artworks can uh, add to each other in ways that create a kind of like uh, something that builds something else, something better. But I do not think that singular acts can do that. So I think that when we are, uh, when we are setting up the, the, the conference in really big uh, terms, uh, I feel like, okay, what we, what we offer is not, let's say a straightforward answer. And often, often the expectation is that you can like offer that type of answer in sort of one sentence. And I think that the, 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 the works that claim to do that are often illustrations of the of of the of of the very circumstances that they that they tend to critique, you know. Uh, so I'm also wary of works reproducing the circumstances that they critique by first quoting them, which is a sort of wrapping procedure in a way, you know, like in order to in order to uh, disprove the, the lie or something to first quote it and then sort of say it's not true, but you prop you propagate it in that in that way, you know. Um, and I think it's also uh, like a like a like an idea of um, um, you know we assume that art and design are voices of resistance against you know these developments, but often they're not. You know, often these uh, they they're very they're not merely compliant with these developments but they're 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 co they're co interdependent with them uh and i think that in in the case of art of course this is also you know art is also a market for example and this is something that you know the values of artworks are also uh, inscribed by their values as uh, on on a market etc so i think this really complicates what art does effectively as an agent of change you know and i and, and that's not to say that people should not earn a living with what they make or that they should uh that this that this is all bad or something but it just makes it really complicated um yeah so so um yeah and i think the, the other thing and last thing and then i will shut up because obviously we also need uh to listen to mckinsey but the, the the is that a lot of Art is about how and not what. A lot of a lot of a lot of what art is appears to be much more about how something is brought forward rather than let's say eventually you know the subject matter or something like that. So there is something in method that we're really interested in in methodology and the way in which method is not a prescribed thing that you just apply, but something that more like emerges out of an iterative 
uh, process. Mm. That's that's what I want to say about it. But I realize that it takes maybe away from the very political um, things you also bring up here. Well, Unless we consider these things as politics, which would be good, perhaps. Yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, so now I would like to um, give the word to Mackenzie Work uh, and maybe perhaps picking up on the on the same sentence. So what are what could be the actionable possibilities for what everyday life could be uh, outside of domination and control, even when we're inescapably subject to phenomena like algorithmically driven internet manipulation, observation capitalism as forms of domination and control? Well, modern art was about the unalienated labor that produces the special commodity versus the mass-produced commodity. But contemporary art is more a kind of financial instrument and the, the more valuable the work uh, in the art market, the sort of less interesting it is as kind of anything else. So maybe in the space of art now, the, the valueless uh, is, is maybe the thing that's interesting as a space to play in, like, like what can't be recognized as value as a financial instrument in an artwork. Uh, but then I'm, I think the, you know, what, what's the difference between art and design? Design maybe is always about utility. And it might be worth putting art in that sense alongside design where you think about like what's use uh, and to, to sort of think the use value part of uh, use value exchange value coupling and to see that as what this is what what Soviet design was about right from that glorious moment in the 1920s is to ask what what utility actually could be. Maybe you think those two practices together as offering ways that you could uh, play in the sphere of the valueless uh, and the sphere of the useless uh, and, and kind of see, you know, what are the possibilities are there with the kind of tools and techniques that are available. Well, thank you. Now um, I don't want to usurp the time, so I ask uh, Alistair and uh, uh, Miguel if they have questions or even the audience. For... Mm -hmm. You have some from the audience? Yeah, we, no, we have something from ourselves, but you okay. can have... <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all three speakers. Uh, Kate's not with us anymore, unfortunately, but uh, uh, Mackenzie and, and uh, uh, Danielle. Um, we seem to be going around something, though. It's been alluded to many times, uh, but I'm maybe going to give it a name, uh, because I think we, we are living in a time of digital imperialism. We, we know that uh, people like Jeff Bezos have been accumulating absolutely vast fortunes whilst most of the rest of the world has been uh, suffering dire economic circumstances as a result of the COVID pandemic. So if we have this topic of uh, digital imperialism, um, how can we confront it? And you said something very interesting uh, from your work in Metahav and Daniel, and that is this idea of moving people. And uh, I think just trying to join something up here that uh, we are moved at the moment because we're having this exceptional experience, uh, uh, a new experience in many of our lives. So we are kind of uh, disturbed and available to be moved, let's say. And yet at the same time, paradoxically, caught in the digital systems because we, we can't do the the physical stuff with each other. Mm -hmm. So this is a deep paradox where the, the digital imperialism has got a fantastic uh, set of circumstances here which it's actually taking advantage of. So how can we how can we encourage, because I think this has to happen at an individual and collective level, how can we encourage ourselves uh, to encourage others to, to step out of this paradox? That's my question, I think. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense. <laughs> I wanted to, I, can't, I cannot answer that question directly, but I wanted to talk about uh, something Mackenzie said earlier, uh, which was in reference to the work of Jackie Wang, and more, more in particular, uh, the book, A Carceral Capitalism. 
uh, cultural capitalism is a you know really really strong and embodied critique well it's more much more than a critique of the prison system in the united states but it's also an invocation of poetry it's also an invocation of the act of dreaming uh, and that is i think um it, and it's and this sounds way more romantic than the book sort of is and um so i realized that um like yeah, I don't really have an answer other than that I think that there are certain works, uh, artworks, books, etc., that that embody this answer more or less, without necessarily invoking uh, the common name or the commonly recognized name for the one who is, you know, like the the, the te techno dystopia or something. That 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 actually, much more than that, boils down to a critique of physical, like physical practices, physical facts, stuff that is not abstract but really, really concrete and real. And I think boiling down to that level um, uh, to, you know, maybe if even the proposal to to not not permit Jeff Bezos from re-entry is stuff that I would now think of, stuff that is sort of really dealing with circumstances. Perhaps we should have a vote on that here, whether Jeff can come back or not, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so um, uh, maybe we still have time for one more question that I would like to ask you both again. Um, but moving on to facts and fiction. And I had the opportunity to watch a very interesting uh, talk by Mackenzie Work on facting and ficting, uh, which of course are two things Meta Haven like to uh, wrap within each other or frame within each other. You you both talk about those things almost in the sociable, uh, as if one contained uh, the other or at least residues of the other. But given all the bad fictions that we see nowadays in Mackenzie's work, uh, words, uh, like conspiracy theories uh, that present themselves in the guise of facts, or given the spread of uh, disinformation the, that in a certain way uh, we can say that inspires Meta Haven to explore uncertainty of what is real and true. So you think there's more agency in fiction to counter bad fictions than there is in facts, or as Daniel said, are fictions, uh, even the good ones, uh, discredited? Well, the thing about conspiracy theories is that the the facts are often right. You know, like the there is a, a, a owner of a pizza place in Washington D.C. who threw some fundraiser for the Democratic Party. Like the you know, there's facts in, in conspiracy theories. The the problem with them is the fictional part. So yeah, I I wanted to think facting and ficting as as uh, practices that. Uh, I've I sort of like closely allied this a sort of disciplinary difference about how one does them. Uh, and that, that maybe it's actually the, not the fictional, that's always the problem, but the particular facts uh, that, that are sort of invoked uh, and become the kind of uh, roadblocks to thinking, you know, because like even, even the most outlandish conspiracy theories tend to have things in them that are actually true uh, and verifiable. It's, it's when you step off that. Uh, oh, and, and let me just give a shout out to, to Metahaven as I think really interesting practitioners of ficting and facting together as practices where you do both those things and think about them not as separate genres but as, as practices you can weave together. Um, I love facting and ficting. Didn't know those, but definitely we'll look into that. That is amazing. Uh, thank you, Mackenzie. I, I was also thinking about the conspiracy theories as fan fictions, because the way that QAnon, uh, for example, I, another word I, I wish I hadn't used, but um, develops, you know, there's not just the fact that several people, users sort of like, um, can sort of tune into that and write their own versions. It's that this also happens in multiple languages that do not affect each other. So there's multiple strands and multiple, let's say, languages and geographies where the same fiction is played out as a fan fiction in order to contribute to, the, to a corpus of material that cannot be cohesive. 
because it's all developed through different strands and yet it acts as a cohesive body. And if we are, let's say, um, not if we are all, uh, concentrating on facting and not on fixing, we risk losing uh, forms of um, media literacy that could be associated with being able to, uh, you know, understand the architecture of these types of constructs. Um, and that's why they're also interesting. And the fact that fact and fiction are interwoven in these constructs, as Mackenzie points out with the pizza place, is also something that really complicates what they are, I think. Uh, but that should not lead, and this is what I wanted to say when I, when you talk about uncertainty and, and, and seeing us as a kind of uncertainty fetishist or something, I do think that, you know, uncertainty is a very lofty thing, you know, you, if you have the luxury to spend your time, like, you know, thinking about uncertainty, etc., it's like, then you have probably, you're doing something wrong, you know, like there's on one level, uh, you know, these things are not sort of play things to like think about as intellectual pursuits, you know, there are also realities that people live in. So I, I'm, I wanted to just make a nuance there that that we, we do not want to fetishize uh, uncertainty as this sort of thing, you know, uh, we, we do want to bring out, you know, yeah. positive emotions in a way but not in the way that Elon Musk proposes, which is sort of like no critical thinking, just vibes. That's sort of like what he talks about with these sort of implants, right? And we could go on about vibes and about what that, me what that means in relation to, to both emotion, but also in the idea of replacing representational language with this sort of idea of just feeling things, which is, yeah, I mean, very troubling. Okay. Um... Picking, maybe picking up on that idea, I'd like to, to leave one, at least one question from the audience before we, we have to close. And this came to us from Patricia Bandeira. And she asks that, as most art institutions are going through what seems to be a, an identity crisis, and they use technologies like VR, white cubes, etc., to try to perpetuate the past, to try to, to imitate the past in a way, which is what very often digital media try to do, anyway. Um, but they do this without reimagining what art, what art education and art schools can be. So, and this is a question to Daniel, uh, what would you expect as you know, a teacher on one hand, but also as a student uh, on the other hand? Uh, as Mm -hmm. Oh God, this is so difficult because we're not an art institution and I think that art institutions are going through more than one um, difficulty right now. It's also, you know, it's things with their human resources and things with their funders and there's like all these levels where they're going through problems whilst at the same time devising um, VR and stuff like that, you know, like I, I think that one, once we were in this film, this film festival, where colloquially it was said that films that are not immersive or 3D or like VR or whatever are now called flatties. <laughs> They're called flatties. <laughs> and uh, so this made us, I think it was made up, Vinka and me, really sort of like critical about this idea of immersive stuff. Like we want to be able to walk away from something. We want to be able to like see something as a, as a fragment of something else and not being completely surrounded by it. So the idea that you, that you overwhelm somebody with, 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 a, with something that's so big that you can't, you, you're not sure anymore. Whereas what I think that the immersion of, of art is so interesting because books don't do that. Books, for example, are immersive in this completely different way that I think that is so powerful because it invokes so much of what the person can do as well. And I think that this interaction between, I mean, there's an amazing VR project, let there no, be no doubt about that. Like um, also a lot of non-Western um, let's say VR projects that are very, very strong about, you know, going around the spirit world and things like that are amazing. But uh, there is there is something where the, what the, the, yeah, the immersiveness can be defined as a much more interpersonal or intersubjective thing than something that's just there in the medium. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I would answer. Okay. Oh, thank you. Well, we are almost at uh, 2 p.m. here um, so we need to wrap up and even if of course there's a lot yet remaining to be discussed but um, we will just have to 
attentively follow the, the future activities of our guests and hopefully continue this discussion at some other venue in the future. Uh, I would like well, to remind everyone that there will be a publication coming out later this year. Um, to remind as... everyone of what? To uh, remind everyone to wear face masks. Oh, yeah, also. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I would like to thank again everyone, our speakers, Kate Crawford, Mackenzie Work, and uh, Daniel and Meta Haven, for their participation in this and their incredible insight. And so stay safe, wear face masks, <laughs> and uh, goodbye. Thank you, thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us.